waters of Point Loma, the venue. A far cry from Fremantle. No Fremantle doctor here, but a brand new class of boats. They're longer, they're wider, they're more maneuverable, and they break more easily, and they're more expensive. 18 seconds. Paul Kayard and his Italian mates are behind at the top mark. Well, the two boats exchanging dives on a downwind leg. The war is going to try and keep America Cube maneuvering. Or try and work in a position to block America Cube's breeze. The problem for O'Moro in the upper left is that America Cube has been about 20 seconds per leg faster got nice than with here. the wind. A3 faster on seven of the eight downwind legs. That's where you go with the spinnakers and the jennikers out. Well, Kayard has two choices here, either to jive under wind or keep splitting jives. The jiving duels worked for him in the past, so I expect him to keep the maneuvering going and not going for the blocked wind yet. Man going up the rigging, Spontini on Omoro. Probably clearing a wire, a halyard to twist it. Right now, Amora pointed much more directly at the bottom mark. American Cube sailing about 45 degrees off course right now. Notice when a guy goes up the mast, he always looks up. You never want to look down. Only look at what you're doing. That's a nice air here. Alberto's wife, Christina, watching over at Club Italia, gets a little nervous when he goes up there about 110 feet high. His mom, Alma, watching back in Livorno, Italy. There are 7 million Italians watching live. It's a little bit now after 10 o'clock at night back in Italy. The problem here, Jim, is that a bat has broken. That's a horizontal stick made out of carbon fiber that keeps the sail extending away from the mast. It's right in this area here, and this and the bat is broken, so he's trying to bang the thing back in, but this is a major problem for Omoro. It doesn't affect the boat going downwind like they are now, but has a major effect on the performance and the sail shape of the sail when they're going back upwind. So Fontini's up there using a hammer, banging that stick back into the sail, and they really need to keep that going. Okay, quite low. Now, America Cube knows that, and as a result, I think America Cube's gonna force Omoro to keep maneuvering. With a broken bat, you can't maneuver as often, or you'll keep breaking the next bat down, the next bat down, and if they all go, you're almost ineffective sailing this boat. Problem. Again, we are on the run, leg number two, A3 in front by 18 seconds, down to the bottom mark. So both bowmen getting workouts today. Jerry Kirby on A3 and Alberto Fontini performing his high wire act again on ITA 25. And they're directly up, they're directly upwind here of the uh, mark heading in this direction. So KR keeping the action centered. But his larger problem is that bat, he won't want to do too much maneuvering here. This is the second America's Cup campaign for Alberto Fontini. He was with Azura back in 87. That's kind of like playing for the Cleveland Indians. Now Fontini's up the mast. He's using sticky back, ready to have to dive sticky back to fabric to try and keep that batten in. It's a tough thing to do. Any moisture in a sail, and that sticky back fabric won't stick to the sail. And as you look down on the sail, you can see the crease in it. That's what's hurting him. But notice the crew doesn't look up at the mast. They concentrate on their job. They're not going to be concerned with the man aloft. There he's leaning out there. He's taking this fabric with the sticky back on it, trying to get it to hold that bat in. And unfortunately, it's impossible it's coming back a to put bit. a new bat in underway.
broken bat in the mainsail is kind of like a guitarist breaking a string. You can keep playing, but it's not quite the same sound coming off the boat. That's what's going to happen here. Not as much speed. that we have observed so far upwind a three seven seconds faster downwind now over four races you can see they really increased their downwind speed because peter's yale statistics showed it 14 seconds faster downwind when we were here for race four so the great fontini stays on the high wire act again el moro continues to trail as we head down toward that bottom mark a three in front they could clinch the Number two, El Moro Di Venezia trailing three races to one. The men of America cubed in front by eight seconds. That was the delta around the top mark. But Peter, to our eye, it looks as if the red boat is catching up just a little bit. Jim, they certainly haven't dropped back much. And, you know, they were out there all day yesterday while we were out on the water. El Moro was testing those downwind sails, building them all night in their sail off. So they may have found some more downwind boat speed. The great Fontini up there, he started sailing at the age of 13 in 470s. The same kind of boat that J.J. Eisler will represent the United States in Barcelona, one of our Olympians, along with Pam Healy. There is the great Fontini. Yeah. Out of Livorno. Yeah, and Mr. Gardini, he says he doesn't get too excited when he wins. He doesn't get too emotional when they lose. Paul Kayard told me last night Mr. Gardini has been a picture of elegance and consistency, encouraging the crew even though they're down 3-1. Unless we think it's going to go to 250 down here. Got a big split. What's the time? So while Fontini continues to work on the baton, Gary has found one. So what's going to happen on a sailboat? And here is a baton. This is a horizontal stick that goes in a sail. There's about eight, auto, eight of them on an America's Cup class boat. And the idea here is that they're very stiff. They're made out of carbon fiber. It's black material, as you can see. And this material costs about $10 per foot, so they're pretty expensive. And what's happened is it split itself in half here. It doesn't have any more pressure in the sail. And once this, this carbon fiber uh, piece starts bending, the whole thing could go. And the problem for Omoro is two of the battens at the top of the sail have now broken. So they've got some major problems. do some quick calculations now with two battens being damaged like that I mean how much over another 15 miles of race course will that hurt El Moro's speed well remember Jim the last time we they had these problems was a couple races against the Kiwis and it didn't really seem to affect their performance as much as we thought but I think it'd be worth a couple of boat lengths around the race course at least all the the big question, will Fontini's repair keep the battens in the sail? As long as they're in the slot, they'll be providing a bit of support. But if they fall out, then they'll have big problems. This boat will be how they do in their maneuvering. And they're going to be babying the boat through the maneuvers, turning a little bit slower than normal, and trying to maneuver less. That's the biggest challenge that Omoro faces. But then again, American Cube, Jim and Peter, have a problem, too, with the mass ram. They can't adjust the position of the mass, the which puts the uh, balance of the boat off a little bit. So both boats having a little bit of a mechanical failure. sound you hear is not a cellular telephone that's a laser gun that Bill Koch has been using his counterpart over on El Moro di Venezia is Robert Hopkins who sailed with Dennis Connor and Peter Eisler back in 87 and another Yaley buddy looking over his right shoulder now looking over his left shoulder searching for wind also checking in on Kayard's position. I don't know. I don't know, but he's... Port wheel. There's Bob Baldridge in the right, working one of the lines. I talked about the effectiveness of the mass position on America Cube. 
they put it in one spot. If the wind either goes up or comes down, that's what will affect the speed of the boat and the balance of the boat. Thank you. left side of your screen Josh Belsky on the right Josh from Newport you don't think the TV sets are tuned in today in Newport do you Christie's and a few of your old watering holes uh, the boathouse is a great place for lobsters I bet they're all on second mark coming into view that's the bottom mark mark number two then we will go around that mark and then go two and three quarter miles back to windward leg number three second beat now after the mark in this position, being so close, Taird will want to initiate attacking duel. He'll test it to see how his battens are doing. But if he can't, if he keeps breaking more battens, he'll have to call that off. The current setting both boats uh, away from the mark right now, to the right as we look at those aerials. There is a shot behind you. This is where America Cube got in trouble the other day coming around this park when Pete Finley almost fell overboard and got his foot wrapped in the gym sheet. That was a very dangerous situation. He could have actually lost his leg. Good discipline by Mike Topa, the, the sail trimmer. If he trimmed that thing in, he would have lost his foot. Course change. Topa recognized the problem and just waited. And Jerry Kirby. Now, course change on the committee boat. 270 due west is the new course that the committee is setting. You know, Gary, it escapes me why KR did not take the chance to attack the wind of America Cube. He simply sailed past their track, jived in downwind of them there, so he's not affecting them at all. Not only that, maybe he went a little bit too far on his track there, sailing extra distance. Exactly. That's a call by Robert Hopkins, the navigator, doing your ley lines coming into every bar. Let's listen in on board A3 as they go around the bottom mark. Not the best takedown you'll ever see. A little late getting their sails in, too. They're going to lose some distance here. Looked better than the one previously where they almost lost the guy's leg. 18 seconds, the delta around the top mark, so Caird hanging in there. Only losing two seconds on the run. We go back to windward. Second beat, leg number three. Both boats having trouble trimming their sails in. I like the fact that O'Morrell only lost two seconds on that second leg where he's been averaging a 17-second loss. So clearly, in spite of the mass problem, this goes made some progress. Great job by Fontini up on the mast. Kayart keeping things in control, only 20 seconds behind. Back to windward we go. A3, can they close it out today? Or can the Italians come back and make it a 3-2 series? After 163 races among 10 boats over three and a half months, it has come down to two. The men of Omoro di Venezia trailing three races to one, and the men of America Cube, who can close out this 92 America's Cup if they can stay in front. 20 seconds, the Delta. We go back to windward for the second time. Peter, how about attacking duel, and what kind of pressure will it put on those battens? It looks like the mainsail of Amora is setting just fine, even though the battens are broken, Jim. So I think the only danger they have is that they fall out. There's a couple of extra wrinkles in the sail, but it looks fast still. Amora sailed two races with broken battens against the Kiwi, so they've learned how to sail with this kind of adversity before. Do you think KR's got to make his move now because when you get to the Z legs, there are really no lead changes? This is it, Jim, right here. This is the most important leg. And in race number four, he did get within one boat length during this race, on this leg. And uh, looking at the shape of the mainsail, so far, no problem for Omoro. So the fix by Fontini seems to be working. Now, 
if I were America Cube, I would try to force a lot of tagging here. Because every time you tag, you put those bats at risk. And again, they remember what happened at the top of the last windward leg where Omoro closed right up to him by applying tack and duel. Boats on split tack, on port tack. USA 23 with a wind coming over the left side and on starboard tack, Paul K.R. trying to play catch up. Hoping the repair job by Fontini holds on the baton. Well, taking a look at the two boats with split tacks here, kind of a surprising tactic that America Cube, with the lead, keeps splitting away from Il Moro. Only three tacks by Il Moro, only two by America Cube. Well, here we go. We just see a tack on the sail track on the left right now. There's the best graphic illustration of the GPS satellite system because as soon as Buddy Melka swung the boat over, the onboard computer reflected it graphically there, and you saw it. Only a three-second delay on that GPS system, and those are signals coming off the boat, going up to a satellite, coming back down. That's how we're able to keep track of these boats while they're racing. Pretty nice stuff. A little different from when you sailed with Ted Turner. Yeah, we had a hand-bearing compass and a bale of yarn to see where we are going. And a maneuvering board. Did everything by hand. Peter, what did you use with Dennis back in 87 on Stars and Stripes? Jim, we had the uh, real beginnings of the onboard computer systems that they, leave, that they have on board now. We had a little laptop PC, a calculator controller. But now they have everything much more refined. If you look at the boats blasting up wind, Jim, this is the most breeze we've had in the America's Cup match. It's up to 13, 14 knots right now. And those conditions, Peter, then would definitely favor America Cube because she has been like a rocket ship in excess of 10. That narrow hole shape of America Cube much faster when the chop gets up and the breeze comes on. And that carbon sail by El Moro, not quite as effective when the wind's over 10 or 11 knots. A reminder, there's the record, three and one. You can see Stars and or USA 23 winning easily when the breeze has been in excess of 10. Italy winning the closest race in America's Cup history, but in about eight and a half knots of breeze. Now, if you're on America Cube right now, you do not think about the finish of the race or getting the regatta over. Just keep thinking about the next pack, the next maneuver, the next finicker set. Course heading, 270 westerly, 13 and a half knots now. Seas are lumpy in excess of three. 20 seconds to Delta. This is a much shorter beat than the first beat, which was three and a quarter nautical miles. This is two and three quarter miles. Back to the third mark. Then we start the chicane, the Z-leg portion on this brand new America's Cup race course. Tomorrow seems to be tilted over more, an indication that she doesn't have quite as much ballast or stability. There you can see the angle of heel and America Cube staying upright a little bit more than Omoro. Incredible as you look at these boats tilt over in the wind to think that over 75% of the weight of the entire boat is down 14 feet below the waterline in a bulb of lead. You sailors have a language all your own, Gary. <laughs> Well, angle heel is an important one, and that's what Buddy Belgas and Paul Kayard steering are concentrating right now, lining up the angle heel with the horizon, just concentrating on steering the boat. And the mark of a good helmsman is how little you turn that wheel, and notice both these guys turn the wheel very little. Expect Cary Grant to climb out of that submarine, like Operation Petticoat. Even the Navy watching the America's Cup today. It's Race 5 Live on ESPN. And the men of ITA 25 trying to get to within one race of tying it up. They're down 3-1. Race summary, USA 23 in front at 18 seconds by the top mark. 20 seconds around mark number two. We go back to windward again. Mark three, a long way away. Kayart, tacking over. 
El Moro going at 10 knots, about a knot faster right now than USA 23. Covering, of course, maintaining a lead by staying between the opponent and the next mark, something that Dennis Conner did not do back in 1983 aboard Liberty. And it cost him dearly losing the cup on that sixth leg, fifth leg of that race. America Cube just doubled their lead here on that long straight line tack there, sailing faster, and that's why we're not seeing Dellenbach covering quite as tightly as earlier. They had that lead. They don't want to get into a tack duel now because there's always the risk of a breakdown. Okay. The broken batten's a factor here, Peter, or is this just A3 speed that we're seeing? Plain old A3 boat speed, a good sailing by the crew of America Cube. The batten's of El Moro, not a factor at all. The mainsail looks fine. Now, as we see the boats coming up wind, the wind was from this direction, but it shifted to over here. So as a result, these boats sailed a long port tack to get into the middle of the screen. Now we'll have a tacking duel in this area. So which side of the course is favored now? Well, I think, o I think Omoro is trying to work the right side and catch up, but the problem for her is she doesn't have the speed. American Q is just a little bit faster, and that's the difference here. Both boats are back in phase with the wind coming over the left side on Port Tack. Five red hulled challenging boats. The Kiwis came with four. No red hulled boat, by the way, has ever won the America's Cup. On the rail on the port side in the blue jacket is Raul Gardini, one of Europe's wealthiest men, 59 years of age out of Ravenna, Italy. He says that the best are always the least paid because they get the best satisfaction. It's always like that. The important thing is that the money comes after. I caught up with him the other day. Roberto Stefano, help with the translation. Bill Koch, the other day, said that you have spent four times as much money as he's spent. Now, he's confessed to $65 million. He's saying you've spent $250, $280 million. If, if Bill were sitting here right now, what would you say to him? Caro Bill. Dear Bill. Noi non abbiamo speso. We didn't spend four times as much as you spent. All the money we invested had a meaning. Industrial profit, advertising profit, institutional profit. We have helped the image of our country and we have had some fun. For you, Bill, it's very different. You have spent $65 million. <laughs> And what does Bill have to show for the 65 that he's spent? Sooner or later, he will have to explain that. But I understand Bill wanted to show that he was able to organize a good defense. Nobody believed in him, and he has already won something. He has a very good boat, and he has done well managing the races. But it's money spent, not an investment. If you win the America's Cup, will you come back and defend? Yes. In Venice? In Venice. Yes. If you lose the America's Cup, do you come back and try again? I have to think about it. I, I know it will take time to think about, but I mean, your gut feeling right now tells you, I will come back, I'm not interested, the politics, the money, uh, just your gut check right now. No, io ho fatto questa sfida con una morale. I followed a certain philosophy during this challenge. Che è finita, è un po' come i sogni. Now the story is over, like a dream. When the dream is over, everything is over. E quindi with all of its ingredients. Lo vorrebbe fare una, dire fare un altro sogno, che adesso al quale non sono preparato in questo momento. And to challenge again would mean to start with a new dream. And I'm not prepared for that. A man of true global vision, Road. SPN sailing team is here, and the men from America Cube, they have led now, now at 18 consecutive marks. Mark number three, after going two and three quarter nautical miles back to windward, another beat. And then the Z legs. First will be the broad reach. And it'll be interesting to see if Buddy Melgus turns over the wheel to Bill Coke in what could be the clinching race. 
Bill's done a good job driving in the reach legs. Bill told me yesterday when we were over in the Cuban compound, he makes up his mind about five minutes before they hit the mark. Still funny at the wheel. He's on the port side. He ducks underneath now. for the crew when the breeze is this strong much more work hauling the sails up and down you'll also notice they take a long time before they start pulling that sail up that's because you don't want it to go down into the water before going up so they keep a lot of tension there you can see it actually pulling up the jib underneath Gary it's still buddy at the wheel he's back over on the port wheel now I'm sure after the set we'll see Bill Cove take the wheel very conservative set here by America Cube, taking their time. But it still looks pretty when that thing comes out. Oh, really accelerating as that sail fills. There's a bill that jumped forward about four knots faster. So 18 seconds, A3 faster on that second beat back to windward. They were behind. The Italians were by 20 seconds around Mark II, by 38 seconds around Mark III. And we start the first of three reaching legs. There's the difference. We talk about the port wheel, the starboard wheel, Buddy ducking underneath. Why in the world would there be two wheels? Let's check in with Gary Jobson and find out why and how they're used. You might wonder why these America's Cup class yachts have two wheels, one on either side of the boat, to steer the boat. Well, the idea is to get the helmsman to windward so you can see both sails working together along with the angle of the heel and watching the wind coming across the water. These wheels are designed at waist height for the helmsman. On Stars and Stripes here, that's Dennis Connor. Now the second wheel is down to leeward, and the idea here is that you can still steer the boat and watch the competition at the same time. America cubed ahead by 38 seconds. The Italians in a must-win situation. The first of three reaching legs, then the button hook turn. Race five live. Come back with us. Uh, the second, one, the first one blew out a few moments ago, and you can see it cost. The Italians carry some precious distance. It did. About two boat lengths lost here. They were 38 seconds behind, and they can't afford these kind of problems. The problem they had is they set a sail that was a little bit too light for this breeze. That's the fabric of the cloth, and the whole thing blew apart. But they were quick to respond and get a new one going. You can see some members of the crew looking up there, Enrico Tommaso. Here is the crew reaction. This is from overhead. There is the chute going. Now, this is something we saw quite often during the Worlds last May and during the early trials, but something that should be happening here in the final trials of the Cup. But I do like the fact that the Italians respond quickly and they're back under control. Good job by the crew. And Kayard is unflappable. He reminds you a little bit in this race of Dennis Conner when he was losing in the deciding race to Bill Koch. Every mark rounding, he was complimenting the crew on Team Dennis Conner on Stars and Stripes, and Kayard has been much the same way. We've seen that over the last three races. And keep in mind, Jim, that America Cube has their own problems. They're not able to move that mass back and forth because of the mass ramp. And there goes Jerry Kirby going aloft to sort out a problem. A couple of trapeze acts today. Second time that Kirby's been up. He was up in the pre-start. This time he's going all the way to the top. That's 110 feet high. What he's doing here is clearing a halyard that got twisted on the spinnaker set, so he got over the top to get it back down correctly so they can set a new sail. He'll get that halyard over the top and then get it down on deck. The ex-hockey player out of Newport, Rhode Island, he was aboard Eagle back in 1987, along with Rod Davis, who, of course, skippered the Kiwi boat this year. A couple of other members of the Eagle crew are also on board. We talked about Mike Topa, and how about Kimo Worthington, part of the B crew? Yeah, Kimo Worthington's done a good job helping tune up. Sailed on the trials and a valuable member of the team. Buddy Melgas has high regard for him, and I think all of them got to be pretty happy here after that disappointing performance on Eagle. A boat that was slow, so slow they used to call it Beagle. 
Now, when you watch Kirby there, you notice he comes down on deck and he doesn't stop moving. Okay, here's the halyard, guys. I'm going to keep going. Never takes a breath. Just keeps right on going. Peter, how much distance did that blown spinnaker cost the red boat? You know, it could have been about three boat lengths by our perspective here, Jim. The Moro was fortunate. They had not dropped their dip sail. They were three sail reaching. So that when the first Jenniker blew out, a very small one, they still had a head sail up and therefore and did a quick recovery, only 62 seconds to get the second Jenniker up and filling. On the deck, they're not going to another uh, reaching type sail. That's an indication that the wind is strong and it'll be quite far ahead as far as a point of sail. So taking a conservative route, going with a head sail for the reaching leg. Also avoiding any sort of protest by the umpires. The Italians have been very concerned with the way it's the American Q team has been handling their spinnaker pole on this tight reaching leg. With a jib up, it will be a moot point. Peter, you were out on the boat yesterday with America Cube. Did they spend a lot of time looking at how they set that reaching sail? Yes, they did. They're Start not going to put it up way. today, are they? Peter Craig, the masked man there. Second best takedown of the damn series. Bill complimenting his crew. And it is Bill Coke at the wheel, by the way. What's the mark? Where's the course? I can't see it. I don't know. 38, the Delta around the top mark. There's Bill at the wheel. Buddy did the first three legs. Coke taking over on the reaching legs. There's Bob Baldridge. Navigator. Coke's been hit in the head twice by the backstay block. He's been presented with a San Diego Chargers football helmet. <laughs> Bob Baldridge came back the other day with one Not of the winch loop. handles. Coke said, uh-oh, he's going to try to finish the job off. I give him a wrench and help him. 5-0 and counting. So you can see what that blown spinnaker has done to the Red Boat's chances on this leg. Falling further behind. 51 around mark number four in what could be the final race of the 1992 America's Cup. Italy in a must-win situation today, hoping to force race six tomorrow. The average margin of victory here, you take a look back in 37, 10 minutes and 55 seconds, four races, 83, seven races. That's when Australia two with John Bertrand at the helm. Upset Dennis Conner, minute 39. Likewise in Fremantle, when the Cooks were waxed 4-0 by Stars and Stripes. And right here in 1992, the closest race in America's Cup history. No question that El Moro's three-second victory in race two helped to bring that margin down. Jim, twice the doing? loser in America's Cup has actually had a faster boat. 1934, Endeavor versus Rainbow. Rainbow was faster, lost 4-2. And then in 1970, in Trepid, with Bill Vicker at the helm, beat Gretel 2, even though Gretel 2 was faster than the American boat all the time, and a score 4 to 1. This maneuver coming around the next mark, the fifth mark, is relatively simple because you're setting a Jenniker again and taking a jib down. It's a little bit tougher when you have a reaching sail up. aerial pictures courtesy of Goodyear's newly painted and renamed airship Eagle. The Eagle reflecting Goodyear's tradition of naming its blimps after former cup winners or contenders of the America's Cup. Live pictures, a little bit of cloud cover. Meanwhile, down in the Pacific, A3 continues to lead. 51 seconds, the Delta at the first wing mark, mark number four, coming into mark number five, that right-hand turn. Right now, Pedro, we're on a close reach. We make that right-hand turn and head down to the sixth mark. Get rid of these boring reaching legs, Jim. Let's get going back upwind again. That's what Paul Kerr is thinking right now. Right now, he's going to hope for a breakdown or something on American Cube. They have a big lead yeah. as far as looking at how far apart these boats have been throughout the series to date. You know, two interesting rumors, as you see Paul Kerr there floating around, that uh, the Italians are starting to negotiate, Peter, for the uh, Driscoll Boatyard to keep their, their base camp in place not far from your office. Have you heard that? 
would be a smart move on their part. They've invested several million dollars and have one of the nicest compounds here in San Diego. I also wouldn't be surprised to see Paul Kayard move to the San Diego area. Of course, he has a house here right now. He, he did move over to Italy to start this Incredible. campaign. And Erica Cube has an option to keep at their facility, too, the next time around. Peter, from your position, is there a reason why Paul Kayard has sailed such a high course on this fifth leg? I mean, he looks like he's throwing away a little bit of distance here. I think he may actually be on a straighter track, and possibly American Cube got a bit low here. It's scary. A bit of current pushing the boats down, and maybe American Cube didn't allow for it in the first part of the leg. Well, as you can see on sail track here, American Cube, uh, a little bit more zigzagging type course, and very divergent. So we'll see if uh, Kayard makes up any time as they head for the bar. Usually these two courses are one right behind the other. You know, it's funny, Gary, you mentioned how the team was out yesterday practicing these jiving mark roundings, switching sails. And of course, when it comes to race day, they don't have to change Jennikers. Just put the jib up and down. I don't think we'll see this zigzag reaching leg in the 1995 Cup. It'll be Winward Lewards. Fremantle, two reaching legs on the race course back there, Pedro. That's right, there were two reaches, not three. Hey, they're tough legs for the crew, that's for sure. A lot of work goes into it, a lot of different sails. Tell you what, at Newport back in 83, when Dennis Conner lost the America's Cup, the second leg was a reach. That's right, but going back towards more of the common match racing course, Windward Leward would not be a bad idea. The right-hand turn, mark number five, A3 in front, 51 seconds at the fourth mark. Bill Koch continues to drive. Josh Spence there up from his sewer spot. Not a, not a friendly job on a boat down there where it's dark and damp. Tough job, but he does it well. I like the way the crew shifts from setting one tail and immediately getting the other one down. Back in race four on Thursday, it was around this mark, Peter Eisler, that America Cube almost broke their mask. Did a much better job this time. A great spinnaker set. Elmoro sail popping filled right now, too. Elmoro a little bit closer. The problem is their sail isn't up at the top of the mast, so it's going to be tough grinding that thing up. Once it fills, there's about 8,000 pounds of pressure on that wire holding the sail up. It's called a halyard. And you can see they've got about seven or eight feet yet to go to get it up there. 35, the Delta around the fifth mark, so a good job by the Italians. They knocked 16 seconds off A3's lead. One and a half miles on the third reach, then the button hook. A hairpin turn like Le Mans out on auto racing. Italy still trying to play catch up. Leg, the third reaching leg. And the white boat, the defending boat, continues in front. Bill Coke, he stays at the wheel. A lot of Bill Coke fans watching the race back at Cape Cod in towns like Osterville, where Bill has a summer home. And in Woods Hole, big America's Cup party going on back at Captain Kidd today. They're watching back there. Pedro? You know, I think looking at all the boats out here watching the races, and there's several hundred. This is a great show. There's a lot of fight in the Italians. Just when you think they're down, if they, they break the Jenniker, they come back on that last reaching leg, closing down 15 seconds. American Cube sailing very well. It's just an enjoyable race to watch. Both crews putting on a tremendous show. Peter, if you're in the trailing boat now, if you're Paul Kayard, after you go around that button hook turn, what do you do on leg seven? How long do you wait before you start the tacking duel? Gary made a very good point. You've got to force the aggression immediately around the mark. Attacking duel, there's a chance that something can break on American Cube because right now they do not want a drag race. Even if Elmora can gain, say, a boat length in a drag race, that's not enough. They need a breakdown, an override, a crew error, something that puts pressure on American Cube. Peter, a 16-second gain on a reach. That's a huge number, isn't it? Dramatic, Jim, and I think one of the differences could have been that straight-line course that KR sailed. 
minimizing his distance. They also put up a third sail. They had a staysail up, which we didn't see on America Cube. That might have added some extra speed, too. But never count the Italians out. And Ron Davis will tell you that. And for America Cube, Peter, you they cannot get too conservative because that's when you start losing things. So they have to keep the hammer down and keep pressing hard themselves. Right now, America Cube going up there about 13 knots. This time, both boats sailing very straight course and Omoro almost in the wake in a direct line. But look at the difference there between the red and the blue in the middle on that fifth leg. America Cube sailing a lower course and as a result, sailing extra distance and losing distance. Now, America Cube is just far and ahead that if they wanted, they could come around the mark, attack right away, be the lured boat, and force Omoro to sail extra distance move that Dennis Conner has used successfully. Pete Fenley was on board as one of the grinders on Thursday. Let's go back and take a look as they went around this button hook turn, the hairpin turn. He almost gets washed overboard, got his leg caught up, and almost lost the leg, Gary. The jib sheet wrapped around his leg there as they're pulling the sails, and I think Mike Tope is actually the MVP here because he has the discipline not to pull the jib in. Notice the jib on the right is out there luffing. Finley's underneath the mess, screaming to help, and Wally Henry, Jerry Kirby, John Spence all get back there to help sort out the mess, and it was a great recovery. Pete Finley, a corporate real estate broker back in Colonia, New Jersey, out of the University of Rhode Island, where he played football. He was pretty loose on board with you afterwards. He and, he and Kirby were just making jokes about it, but it was a very serious situation. Now the button hook turn. This is kind of like a hairpin turn at Le Mans. Very challenging to the crew. First time this has been used in an America's Cup race. America Cube very wide of the mark. Usually you want two to three boat lengths. This time they're about four to five lengths away. So Moro has a chance here to slice with another five or six seconds out of the time. Boy, very conservative rounding here by these guys, taking the spinnaker down well early. They don't want to risk any mistakes like they had the other day. So down comes the Jenniker. They'll raise the jib, they'll jibe, and 180 degrees. And it's still Bill Koch at the wheel. We'll go back to windward, lake number seven. Five was the Delta. There's Fontini. Maroney up working on the mass position. They kind of flip-flopped the last two races. Very aggressive takedown on Omoro. That's very late. The sail's half in the water. With all that sail like that, that's a lot of windage. That does slow you down. That doesn't help. They are checking to make sure that the lines are well clear of the mark. But I do like the attitude of going for it, holding the spinnaker as long as you possibly can to squeeze every bit of distance out of this as you can. Good move. 39 was the Delta, Gary, so A3 increased their lead by what could be four precious seconds. We've had the closest race in the history of the America's Cup. Race two in Italy, crossed the line, three seconds in front. The stretch drive to the finish, back to windward, then the downwind finish of race five and maybe the regatta. For the cup from the hallowed halls of the New York Yacht Club, it traveled to Fremantle, Western Australia, where we witnessed live, and you did too, the greatest regatta to date. 1992, Bill Koch defending for the San Diego Yacht Club, Buddy Melgus, Dave Dellenbaugh, and the men of America Cube, and another wire-to-wire -wire victory, apparently. Still a long way to go. We go back to windward here on leg number seven, then the downwind finish, where you can see some lead changes. And here comes the tacking duel, Peter, that we expected. They are throwing everything he can at them right now. Very, very choppy down here by the bottom mark, Jim. All the spectator fleet, I'd say the waves are 
four feet down here, and they smooth out the two feet at the top mark. So the boat that can cut through the waves better has an advantage, especially at the bottom part of the course. Much better tack. 17th man on board A3 today in that yellow jacket is Vincent Moyerson, executive vice president of America Cube, responsible for a lot of the technical aspects, and there are many. There are, and I think Vincent Moyerson and Buddy Milk is are really the heart and soul of America Cube. Vincent's the man that took the way took the technical team and developed this fast pole and deserves a lot of credit and that's why he's being rewarded with the 17th man spot today a the shot of Vincent. he's originally from belgium came over this country in 1984 as a bowman on a maxi boat named condor ended up working for bill coke running matador graduated through the program to take over all of bill's marine programs and has become quite a technical wizard he's an engineer by trade our Cadillac race conditions, the course heading 270 west, breeze at 13 and a half knots right now. Seas are not as lumpy as they were, as you heard Peter Eisler. 39 seconds, the time around mark number six, the button hook. Peter, given the weather conditions today, realistically, what would the delta have to be at the seventh mark for Paul Kayard to be able to play catch up on the downwind stretch drive? <laughs> Without a breakdown, Jim, I think Kayard would have to be ahead at the top mark for him to realistically have a chance of winning. America Cube is that much faster downwind. For some of the men aboard El Moro, it's their first America's Cup campaign, like Luca Dignani, the port trimmer. And Daniel Bresciano, one of the grinders. But for others, like Massimo Galli, they were aboard Italia back in 87. Andrea Moroni aboard Italia then. And David Tizano, a gold medal winner. You were in Seoul for the Olympics when Tizano won that gold medal. And Paul Kayard almost got the Olympics in 84, losing the trials by one point. The team that beat him, Bill Buck and Skipper in the star class, went on to get a gold medal. This is what Peter was talking about. When they get to the seventh mark, USA 23 has been, over the previous four races, 17 seconds faster downwind. A little after 11 o'clock in the evening, back in Italy, as many as 7, 8 million Italians watching live on television back in their homeland, rooting for that red hole boat. This is as far as any European challenge has ever gotten in the history of the America's Cup. Carrying the weight of all of the challenges. Spain, Sweden, New Zealand. We're losing our ass here, though, because we're two different wins. Two different wins. God damn it. Coming down now, Jib's back. Peter, you live here. Paul Kerr talking about being two different winds, but it's not all that unusual. You've got the Catalina, you've got the El Nino. That's right, Kerr complaining. The boat's separated by a couple hundred yards, 300 yards possibly, and a big wind shift, big difference in that much difference uh, apart, Jim. Their wind direction about 30 degrees different right now from the sails, the wind going on to the sails of American Cube and that which is blowing on the sails of Il Moro. When that happens, there's two options for KR. One, to tough it out and wait for the wind to come back, or two, to tack and try and break the pattern. And perhaps in this condition, I, I think tacking there would have been good just to get all American Cube off their uh, mark. Now here they are, they've only had a few tacks in this area here, but the wind shifting back and forth in America Cube got a shift where the wind went to this direction from the wind that we have over here and be got a big gainer there. Now the wind's coming back and Memorial has a chance again, but that's tough when it's like that. Picking those wind shifts is why Dennis Connor and Tom Whitten were such a formidable one-two punch and extended Bill Coke and Buddy Milgas in the Defender Trials. It's coming down again. The significance here is that Kayard starting to call his own shots and spending a lot of time looking at the other boat, and that's not a good sign. One of the things he sees is that Bill Coke is driving America Cube, 
having a bit of a tough time as the breeze is shifting here, though not really shifting gears as well as say Buddy probably could. Which is surprising that KR doesn't start tacking. Buddy takes over the wheel if KR keeps the pressure on. Jim, I get the feeling that Bill Coach is going to drive this boat from now right across that finish line. That's what he's worked for for a long time. And that would be his reward is to steer this boat from here to the finish. The breeze will come back. Both boats in phase. It's the seventh leg, 39 seconds. The Delta around the button hook, mark number six. But KR catching up. The seventh mark rounding. You won't miss it, so come back with us live. And on split tacks, we're welcoming you back to the Pacific. On starboard tack, the wind coming over the right side. The red boat, that's the challenging boat from Italy. Meanwhile, staying on port tack and still Bill Coke at the wheel. Pedro? Breeze dropping down a little bit right now, Jim medium wind conditions, something we've seen Omoro liking a bit more. KR getting back towards the center of the course. Delenba opting not to cover. An interesting move, considering they are off on the right side of the course. Yeah. Okay, right after this wave. Okay, tacking. The importance of the conditions. You can see A3 has been literally a rocket ship in breezes in excess of 10 knots. And the sea's lumpy. But when the breeze dipped down below 9 knots, it was the Red Hole boat, that boat, off the Mont Edison assembly line. By just three seconds, though. No runaways in any of these races. every bit of the lead the boat had at the bottom mark. Of course, the outcome of this race will determine so much. The home of the America's Cup will stay at the San Diego Yacht Club if the white boat continues in front. That will affect the number of defense syndicates in 1995 and also the number of challenging syndicates. No question it's easier for New Zealand to come to San Diego than it is to go to Venice. And there's rumors around town that a German group wants to purchase a lot of equipment from the Kiwis so they can get into this cup arena. Now those battens there on El Moro, two battens at the top, you can see the white stripes have broken. That definitely hurting the performance of the Italian boat. But even still, they're uh, go, sailing effectively. Here we go. Italy tacks over to starboard. Closer, Peter. That's what we thought too. I just asked the Mark Walsh, our spotter here. It says it's about the same, from his perspective. There will be a real dogfight at the San Diego Yacht Club. A lot of the power brokers there trying to shake things up. What about Bill Koch? Will he come back if Commodore Fred Delaney asked him to to defend? I think my answer would be to him. If you could graze the $64 million question, if you give me that $64 million, I'd be happy to defend it for you. But if you want me to put up the $64 million, plus go through all the political rigmarole that I went through last time, forget it. It'll be interesting. Let's not forget a man named Connor. He'll be coming back to defend. I think he'll be coming back from a yacht club on the East Coast, though, Gary. USA Yacht Club is Dennis's new club that he's uh, organized out of North Cove Yacht Harbor in New York City. 
you know, Jim, you're listening to that soundbite. Bill Koch saying he'll do it if somebody else pays for it. I wonder if he has changed his mind about the hired guns. Sounds like he wants to be a hired gun. And he has told us that the Cuban fiber mainsail cloth that we see here is going to be on the market, marketed very soon. So he's got some commercial interests going here. Ethiopian um, sports resting inside the San Diego Yacht Club. And as we go around mark number seven, maybe an insurance policy for the old mug. If the men from America Cubed hang on, that will be the home for the next three years until the 1995 regatta. Will Bo, Bill Coke come back and defend? What about Buddy Melgus? Think Buddy would come back one more time? He's got an Olympic gold medal and maybe now an America's Cup victory. Joining George O'Day as both uh, America's Cup helmsman and an Olympic gold medalist to be able to hold on here. Back before it's worth by uh, Buzz Moss back a couple days ago. I don't think Buddy will come back. Maybe as a coach, Maybe as an assistant, but I don't think as a full-time player. Yeah. He's lost 16 pounds the last month. There's Rick Brent in the center of the screen. Buddy, two-time Olympic medalist. Gold, of course. Back there in his home in Lake Geneva. That's the great thing about sailing. You see that bronze medal in 64. What other sport can you be at the top of your game, game for that many years in your life? number seven. Peter, you remember the emotion that you felt when you went around the seventh mark back in Fremantle and Stars and Stripes was waxing Kookaburra 4-0? Sure do, Jim. That time it was a downwind mark. It was the America's Cup buoy. They're over a minute ahead. It was a cruise all the way home, and it was one of the most enjoyable memories of our lives. You remember what Dennis Conner said? He said, take a look, boys. It'll be the last time you see it for a while. in the center of the screen. His dad is a doctor. They're watching ESPN in the operating room. Now, Karen's got to be careful not to go past the lay line here, the direct course to the mark, because he can throw distance away. Here he comes around. One thing to keep in mind is the breeze has been up and down here. It's getting flukier out here. Some shifts, some puffs of wind. So that could play into the advantage of Ilmoro, even though we think they're a touch slower on the downwind legs. Now, Jim, uh, Ilmoro is on a direct course for the mark here, and the wind is coming from this direction, and this wind shadow off America Cube going like this, and so Ilmoro sailing clear wind as they go for the mark is a great opportunity to catch up. I think that Kayard's done a great job on this leg. He's really moved up a lot. 39 was the delta around the button hook, mark number six. And he's within three and a half, maybe four boat lengths right now. Buddy Melga's back at the wheel. There's sewerman John Spence. They call him Labby. Jerry Kirby with a harness on, the bowman. This could be the last mark of the America's Cup until 1995. Let's listen in on board A3. Second game for the challenging boat, El Moro di Venezia, the Moor of Venice. On board, the Merchant of Venice. That's where Mr. Gardini would like to take the America's Cup. 24 seconds, so this race has a long way to go. Two and three-quarter miles downwind. The red boat can block the air of the leading boat. That's how you'll have a lead change, so don't go away. Can the Italians come back, or will A3 clinch it? survivors. The men aboard ITA 25, El Moro di Venezia and USA 23, America Q. 24 seconds separates the two boats, the Challenger and the Defender around that seventh mark. 
two and three quarter nautical miles. Look at that. We are going off in different directions now. How come? Jim, very curious move by America Cube here at the bottom of the screen. They're on starboard, now jiving to cover, but the fact is they let Omoro get a long way away. They must be very confident that they've got the good breeze to do something like that, because the golden rule of match racing, cover. Stay between your opponent and the mark, and they haven't done it. They're at risk right now if the wind shifts to Omoro's advantage. Let's go back a few seconds around mark number seven now. Watch on the four deck. Alberto Fonsini, the bowman. Watch what happens right there. Well, the spinnaker pole kind of got him in the head. He's hurt. You see his put his hand up there? From another angle, right there. He's lucky that didn't knock him overboard. If it knocked him out, he would have gone right in the water. He's back there. Jerry Kirby said, another bowman. They tried to get him to move to the back of the boat when he was 24. Jerry's 35 now, nicknamed Tarzan. As these boats come together now, the key will be what happened with the wind while they split. Does Italy keep going for attacking goal, or do they try to attack America Cube's breeze? They're coming together here, and they, I think they look a little closer. This race is not over. The wind shifted about five degrees in Omoro's favor. That's why they jived over. Now, as the two boats come together here, they're going to converge in this course like this. And what Omoro wants to do is get in a position so they're right here compared to America Cube to block their wind in this area. Don't forget, guys, we had one race in the Louis Vuitton finals or semifinals between France and Italy where France came from four minutes and 20 seconds down on split jive and beat El Moro. El Moro's jive here, and the reason they're jiving in this position is to block America Cube's breeze. The wind is coming off El Moro at the top of the screen in a direct line at America Cube's sails right now. So that's at least what they hope to have happen. Yeah. Now, if you look at this boat, think of a spotlight like this. This is how the wind shadow goes. They're trying to block the wind of America Cube right here, and I think the breeze is just ahead. But if that spinnaker on America Cube starts bobbling a little bit, it's an indication that Omoro's blocking that wind, and America Cube will be forced to jive away. Every second America Cube can hang on, they're that much closer to the finish line. They still have clear wind. We're slipping away from it. That was Bill Cope. We're slipping away. Making nice change to leeward of him. Looks like an airport. You got steady pressure, buddy. Notice El Moro's spinnaker on the left having a little trouble bobbling. That's because Kayard is trying to sail too low a course. He's trying to get down to a position where he can block America Cube's wind. Now, it's hard to believe from this distance you can do it, but that wind shadow extends 10 mast lengths. Water mast 100 feet high, that's 1,000 feet. They're closer than that. The beeping sound, the two laser guns, Robert Hopkins manning the one on the red boat, the challenging boat from Italy, and over on the white boat, Bill Koch, who's relinquished the wheel over to Buddy Melgus. After the Italians did a terrific job on the seventh leg, making up 15 seconds. Rick Brent just slapped Josh Belsky on the shoulder. That finish line inching up ever so close. And the dreams, perhaps, of Raul Gardini slipping away, trying to take the America's Cup to Venice, representing the America's Cup and the challenges for all of Europe, not to mention the Kiwis, whom they eliminated when they come back from a 3-1 deficit. The finish line in view when you come back with us. Of the America's Cup. When it comes to service and selection of Corvettes in Tampa Bay, Dimit Chevrolet Geo does it again with more choices, better value, and the area's number one team of certified service experts. And right now, the Dimit Chevrolet Geo luxury lease makes it easier than ever for you to set sail in the luxury sports car America drives. Corvette, come see our fleet. Dimit Chevrolet Geo, just south of Countryside Mall, Clearwater. Sure or the watch, or the glassware, or the jacket.
or the hats, or the jewelry. Choose from a collection of officially licensed products of America's Cup 92, available now at retailers across the country. Or you can call today for your free official 1992 America's Cup merchandise catalog. Call 1-800-92-CUP-92 and take the cup home, America. Back live in the Pacific. The finish line looking back at the two boats. The Defender, USA 23, America Cube, the third generation boat built by Bill Koch. He came with four. Kansas was their heavy air boat. This the boat nominated for the defense. And it's doing just fine. Thank you. Up three races to one. El Moro Di Venezia built five off the Mott Edison assembly line. This is number five. One of the built-in advantages for the Defender. They can wait until the very last minute to name down. their boat. But he's still at the wheel. Let's listen in and go on board with the men of America Q. Big gainer here by America Q. So that split, the wind went their way. It was a good call. Raul Gardini, the budget reportedly whatever it takes. He said if it's spent, there's little to talk about. Our expenses have been zero. He said he's a creative man. He doesn't start thinking about only cost and profit. He also said he does not envision himself to be a Bill Koch or a Thomas Lipton or an Alan Bond. He said he didn't want to make too strong a name for himself. It's the cup that has the name. He was hoping to take it to Venice. It looks now like it'll stay at the San Diego Yacht Club. How many will come and challenge in 1995? Covering the America's Cup is more than tradition for Goodyear blimps. Two of their three blimps, the Eagle and Stars and Stripes, named after former America's Cup winners or contenders. Hard to imagine in 1995 a blimp named America Cube. Defiant, yes. Jayhawk, yes. Kansas, yes. America Cube, bad blimp name. I wonder if we'll get a handoff on the helm again with Bill Coe taking it across the line. Tomorrow heading off in this direction, America Cube going here, and the key is the finish line right in this area here. That's the point that they're heading for, where everybody's trying to get to, only about, oh, I'd say a third of a mile away now. Now you got a pop. For years has been a challenger-driven event. A lot of people thought that it also had evolved into a challenger-dominated event. The last two Louis Vuitton Cup winners, Australia 2 and Newport in 83, Stars and Stripes in Fremantle in 87, went on to win the America's Cup. But not this time. The challenger will go home with just the challenging cup, the grand prize, Yachting's Holy Grail. Days on the shores, of San Diego at the San Diego Yacht Club. This is a fascinating man. He has quite a relationship with Paul Kayart. Not exactly like father and son. He has taught Paul Kayart to expand his horizons beyond the map, make his map more of the world. True visionary. Oh, it's kind of anxious there, kind of pacing around, turn, looking at the wind, keeping things going. Nobody else talking about much. This is a man that started sailing eight years ago, closing in on Yachting's grand prize. Perfect Cube doing the right thing, driving to stay between Omar on the finish. Actually, it's good to keep everybody going. It gets rid of nervous energy. the Italians driving over. There's the finish line here. Only a quarter mile to go now.
like a big lead, but this will be, Jim, the closest America's Cup in history between two boats. It will Speed also bar. be the most expensive America's Cup in history. And the cost will have to come down for nations like Australia to come back. It's soft here. For countries like Spain and Sweden and Germany to mount a challenge in 95. And for more U.S. defense efforts. Still soft. America Cube only needs to jive one more time. those aboard Kookaburra back in 87 when you're trailing and the final race and the finish line are in sight and there's a boat in front of you. I believe Bill Koch is going to let Buddy Melgus steer it across the finish line and I think that's a class move. He was once called the farmer in the Wall Street Journal because of his agribusiness background but he is in no means a bumpkin. He envisions a European community. Started working toward that when he was 25 years of age. Said he considered himself a missionary for all of Europe. Bill Koch's mission is nearly complete. was once told there is no second. The Italians are feeling that an ocean and a continent away. We'll go on board A3, the final delta, 44 seconds. So in all five races, all five winners were wire to wire. The biggest winner, Bill Cope, Buddy Melgus, and the men aboard America Cube. We'll go on board, so don't go away. moment it is on board USA 23 for men like Wally Henry picked on the A team said he was lucky to be one of the chosen few and glad he wasn't part of the selection process. How about John Huffnagel on board one of the grinders he was with Dennis Connors losing effort aboard Liberty back in 1983 talking about the B team Huffnagel said you know those guys are supporting you but you also know if you make a mistake they have to be mad and congratulations to to Paul Kayard and his afterguard, the Kiepi brothers, Enrico and Tommaso and Robert Hopkins, 
and all the Italians because they ousted the Kiwis. They came back once from a 3-1 deficit and they handled their campaign with a lot of class. How about Jerry, per Jerry Kirby and Mike Topa, Gary? Men that were aboard Eagle, the Beagle, the slow boat skippered by Rod Davis. Look at the emotion. And both Jerry Kirby and Mike Topa growing up with the America's Cup, living in Newport, Rhode Island. It's a dream come true. Like any locker room, the Super Bowl, or the Final Four, or the Stanley Cup. And in the middle of that mess is Peter Eisler. How about this? The winning the America's Cup. Congratulations, buddy. Well, thank you, Peter. This is a great day for us, and it's certainly a wonderful day for me. But all these guys that supported this organization, I know there was a lot of negatives that hit the press, but I'll tell you what they didn't know is what the core of this group really is. And by God, they're terrific. Oh, is that cool? <laughs> now tell me, buddy, did this happen in 1972 over in Kiel? Is there champagne on the boat? No, you know, it was uh, that real scary situation in Munich, and we were scared to celebrate. But this is the greatest. This is certainly the greatest. Goes right along with that gold medal, I might say. So tell me the truth. When did you realize this team had the potential to win the cup? Well, I've been thinking that for at least two months when we were experiencing how fast this boat is and, and what her potential really was. And I still don't think we've hit her real sweet spot yet. Name a most valuable player on board the boat today. Oh, geez, they're every one of them. It's too difficult to say who was the most valuable. But you'd have to give it to David Dellenbaugh for the start and, and the tactics. And, and you know, his cool-headed, cool head Joe, man, he's terrific. I would, I love sailing with that boy. And, I mean, you know, to repeat what we had in, in uh, Fremantle and now finish it off this way, what else can you ask for? Great. On behalf of the ESPN sailing team, buddy, we're all proud of you and the entire team. Jim, back to you. Jerry Kirby, he'll go back home in about two weeks to Newport, Rhode Island. He'll be working on a construction job. It's a duplex mansion he's building there on Newport's famous Bellevue Avenue. The celebration continues. Back with Bill Koch and more from the Men of America Q. The team has come over. Folks from the tender, they're all on board, and Peter Eisler's finding out again that champagne burns. On board with the mastermind of the America Cube team, Bill Koch, congratulations. Thank you very much, Peter. I want to say today we're proud to be Americans. This is a triumph for America and American technology and American teamwork. I think, you know, we've got an all-American team here. We're so proud of it. One more can I say. How different when you first started this campaign back in September of 89 or when it was, how different is it now than what the idea that you thought the America's Cup was? Well, it's completely different, Peter. It's too long to, you know, a lot more time, a lot more money, a lot more effort. Uh, a lot more publicity, et cetera, et cetera. But right now, I would say it's worth it. Maybe in a sober moment, I'd look back and say it's too much money, but this, this moment is very precious for us. And what's most precious is the fact that I shared it with 200 people, and we've all become a very close and, and warm family. You can tell, you know, how excited we are. The great spirit on board. Now you can tell us the Gazzini reports. What was your expectation of Amora going into this series? We thought Amora would be faster than us in uh, above 12 knots of breeze, and we'd be faster below her, and around seven knots, significantly faster. And what surprised us was that we sped this boat up. We met, we had this boat designed primarily to go against Dennis in seven knots, and then we sped her up for seven knots to get uh, against Del Moro because we thought the wind was going to be very light and fluky. Instead, the wind came up. But the improvements we made sped her up all the way around, so we think we're faster even in her conditions, which are 13 knots. I'll tell you another secret. There's nothing on Cassini, except some wind computers. That's all. No secret spy stuff, nothing. Woo! You faked us out. Hey, Bill, now that the defense is over, this time around, San Diego Yacht Club will defend again in 1995. Will you come back and do it again for us? Right now, I just want to savor this victory, Peter. And if I can help then, I'll think I'll, uh, folks, got champagne in my eye. 
but if I could help then, I'd be happy to, but I gotta find the right way. I can't see, I got champagne all over me. Thank all right, you. Jim, it's all back to you. Jerry Kirby, the bombman on board the winning boat, said in your wildest dreams, when he was asked if you'd like to have Bill Koch run your syndicate, Jerry Kirby said, for all the heat he takes in the press, if you're on his team, you wouldn't want it any other way. Paul Kayard has said sailing the course is like playing tennis. Not only are the lines moving, but the net is going up and down. So too the Italian chances, but they came further than any European syndicate has ever come before. Congratulations to Kayard and his crew for a job well done. Bill Koch's buzzwords, talent, teamwork, technology. He has a world-class wine and art collection. We'll nail down the Renoirs and break out the Lafitte. Tonight, we'll all be back and put a period on America's Cup 92. We hope you'll join us. Don't forget, the Indy Time Trials are coming up next. We'll see you back here in San Diego later tonight. But for now, for Gary and Peter and all our ESPN sailing team, congratulations to the men of America Q. The Cup stays in San Diego. you have only two choices for business computer systems. Think again. Hewlett Packard. Secret ingredient that gives Diet Pepsi an unfair advantage. Uh-huh. Well, what is it? It's like this, baby. With 100% uh-huh. I just feel safer in a European sedan. The Cadillac Seville. It passes federal side impact tests today, which are not required of all automobiles until 1997. It provides the added control of anti-lock brakes and the reassurance of a driver's side airbag. The Cadillac Seville. Drive one soon. It could change the way you think about American automobiles. 1987 to keep international yachting's America's Cup where it belongs, in America. Now we're setting a new course for the American automobile with the award-winning Seville STS. The highly acclaimed Eldorado Touring Coupe and the advanced new Alante, pace car of the Indianapolis 500. Experience the winds of change at your Cadillac dealer. It could change the way you think about American automobiles. Back on Chrysler Fifth Avenue. The sails aren't made of canvas anymore. The decks have never tasted varnish. And it takes more than a ship's bell to count time. But as long as the sea is salty and the wind blows hard, the sailor can never be replaced. The Citizen Watch Company salutes all those competing for the America's Cup. Citizen, official timer of the America's Cup. And here for you. Full of heart-pounding excitement, this is the America's Cup. I'm Gary Johnson, and when I want the inside story, I turn to the official program of America's Cup 92, published by Yachting. And now you can, too. Inside this collector's edition souvenir program is everything you'll need to know. The Cup's history, the race course, and the competitors. It's all here, the story of winners and the beautiful boats they sail. Call today and get your copy for only $5 and 141 years of cup history all shot by the world's top yachting photographers with over 200 full color pages and if you order now you'll also receive the official video of the america's cup both for just 49.95 the price of the book alone so call 1-800-282-ESPN and order now the official car of the America's Cup. When it comes to service and selection of Corvettes in Tampa Bay, Dimit Chevrolet Geo does it again with more choices, better value, and the area's number one team of certified service experts. And right now, the Dimit Chevrolet Geo luxury lease makes it easier than ever for you to set sail in the luxury sports car America drives. Corvette.
Come see our fleet. Dimit Chevrolet Geo, just south of Countryside Mall, Clearwater. Race in the long history of the America's Cup was in fact sailed in English water. The Yacht America crossed the finish line 18 minutes ahead of her nearest rival. Daniel Webster proclaimed, America is first, there is no second. From schooners to tall sloops as the Civil War ran its course. And then peace and prosperity and grand yachting returned. Edison invented the camera, and like magic, moving pictures of the majestic giant boats appeared, capturing the essence of the sport. It was an era of personalities with names like Sir Thomas Lipton, who tried unsuccessfully five times. Theo M. Sopwith, an owner who steered with his wife along as timekeeper. And Harold Vanderbilt, known not for his considerable money, but for his organizational skills. The J-Boats ushered in the 30s, and like their owners, were larger than life. As Stanley Rosenfeld wrote, there were bigger sailing ships to be seen, but none with Marconi rigs, which seemed like narrow slivers of white cloth piercing the sky and taking wing. In 1956, the deed of gift was changed and the 12-meter class was born. The 70s witnessed the birth of perhaps the greatest 12-meter ever built, Courageous. At her helm, Ted Turner and a young Dennis Connor. So began the legend and a redefinition of dedication and preparation. Then the Aussie invasion of 83. Alan Bond was back with those things called wings. The wing keel, designed by the late Ben Lexon. This cup campaign forever changed the course of cup design, technology unprecedented in cup history. Dennis Connor's aggressiveness and preparedness put him up three races to one. He had a slower boat, and he had the lead. But Aussie skipper John Bertrand brought the men from down under back to square the series three all, setting up the race of the century. For the first time in 132 years, the cup had been wrestled away. Bond welcomed the world to the land down under and showed off Ben Lexon's wing keel. Fremantle, Western Australia, a place and a time forever etched in history. The boat stars and stripes 87 and the men who made her run. The venue gauge roads and the heavy seas of the Indian Ocean with a Fremantle doctor churning those seas to dangerous heights. Man against the elements for the supremacy of yachting. It was the Yanks against the Aussies, and it was no contest. Dennis Connor, whose drive and energy and undeniable skill combined to create an almost irresistible force. Then in 88, Connor would defend in a catamaran. He called it the legalized ambush. The Kiwis came at him with the big boat, nearly twice the size of the 12 meters. When it was done, on the water and in the courts, the cup stayed in San Diego, a mismatch that never should have happened. Four years later, the venue the same, but a new class of boat, longer, wider, more powerful, more maneuverable, more breakable. Dennis Connor was back too, but the master of the multiple boat campaign suffered the perils of only one boat, the new barons of the 90s, a familiar Kiwi, but a new title, Sir Michael Fay. Italy's Raul Gardini poured in tons of lira, and Bill Koch brought his art and his wine and his bank book. The trials to determine the challenger have been as ferocious as for the defender, but we've also witnessed the closest racing in America's Cup history. When the trials were done, the Italians hoisted the Louis Vuitton Cup, ironically with American Paul Kayard in charge. For the defense, it was Bill Koch who took away Dennis Conner's crown and savored the sweet taste of victory. The final two started. We've seen the closest racing in America's Cup history. We've witnessed protests disallowed. They've been battling each other for one week now. The perils of the Pacific have produced a high wire act, as well as men almost being washed overboard. The men of El Moro are poised and ready. With all their guns aimed and loaded at each other, the Italians must cross first today or it's over. 